will be on Tasa's web web. It will be on Tasa's YouTube channel within 10 business days. Thank you. Let me get that out again. It will be on Tasa's channel within the next YouTube channel within the next 10 business days. And if you can't hear the number to call in is at the top of your chat box and I will be monitoring all the questions. So chat them in. And I'm now going to unmute uh, Crystal. Hold on, Crystal. I'm going to unmute Crystal. I've lost you, Crystal. There you go. I'm going to then unmute Sundal. And, and I'm going to unmute Halle. And I am going to let them rock and roll with this. So y'all introduce yourselves. I'm out of here. I'm paying attention just like everybody else. There you go. Thank you, Wendy. So my name is Crystal Garcia, and I have the pleasure of being the voices coordinator for um, formerly known as the Diversity Task Force, and I've been doing this work a long time. Voices work is my favorite part of my job. And today's webinar is a part two. Um, so before we get into content for today, um, just a reminder, the part one um, will be on TASA's YouTube channel. Um, also at the end of this, um, when you get the slides, um, we um, have kind of made it to where you can get some of the old content as well as the new content. So um, that will be helpful. Um, and then each part stands alone separately, but they do go together. So there will be points in today's presentation when I'm referring back to stuff we talked about last Friday. So happy to have new callers on the line. Hope we have some second callers um, that came back for part two. Um, we're gonna move through this. If it lets me move through my slides. There we go. So TASA is the statewide advocacy organization that works to address and eliminate sexual violence through public policy, training, prevention work, and support through programs that serve survivors of sexual violence. VOICES is a subgroup of TASA. Uh, VOICES stands for Valuing Our Identities, Cultivating Equitable Spaces, and is the team formerly known as TASA's Diversity Task Force. We have a long history of um, Implementing our mission, which is to facilitate access to reliable and accurate resources to develop cultural capacity. We inform, empower, and support service providers in their goal to offer culturally informed services. So um, we are most noted for our work um, with the Diversity Task Force Scholarship. So we encourage you all to watch out for that and um, apply for one of those scholarships if you are interested in doing so. Our panelists today um, are two people I absolutely enjoy working with. Their bios are in front of you. I'm not going to read them all, but they are amazing bios, as you can tell. Um, Halle is currently the victim advocate with the Frisco Police Department. She began her work at the Turning Point Rape Crisis Center. Um, she has presented both at state conference and national conferences on improving trauma-focused services, providing culturally responsive care and collaborating with law enforcement. Um, and she is the current board president for TASA. And she has been a long time Voices member. So always happy to hear her insights and her achievements. And um, Holly has recently gone back to school and she's getting her master's in multicultural women's and gender studies at Texas Women's University. And then Sandal Ali is the youth program manager at New Friends New Life, which is a drop-in center for youth um, who are at high risk or have been sex trafficked, exploited in the commercial sex industry. Um, she started out as a prevention educator, which is a place in my heart because that's how I started out this work too. Um, so she's worked with youth and community-based settings, um, specifically working with anti-trafficking and anti-sexual violence curricula. Um, she has experience in Washington, D.C. and Texas. Uh, she holds 
a bachelor's in public health from George Washington University, and she has done work all over the world in Nepal and Uganda. So, all right. So for today's content, um, I'm just going to start out with a little bit of review from what we've seen last week. Our focus for this particular series of training is to talk about how all oppression is connected and no single oppression holds more weight than any other. And when we do anti-sexual violence work, we are in fact, doing anti-oppression work um, because everything is connected and sexual violence is rooted in oppressive behavior and oppressive systems. And that is part of rape culture and um, it's deeply seated in there. So um, for us to continue our goal to end sexual violence in our community and build safer communities for future generations, um, we have to um, continue to do anti-oppression work. So that's what we're going to be focused on today. Um, our last session ended with this particular slide and we were asking our participants to think through these particular questions. What does it mean to have a commitment to cultural capacity? What does that look like in day-to-day -day practice? And what skills would you like to grow in in order to contribute to that commitment? Um, so that is what we're going to really be focusing on today. We're going to do this just a little bit differently rather than being a lot of content where we're going to be talking at you. It's going to be more of a conversation. We want you to interact with us ask questions from our panelists. Um, we have a few planned questions in here, but um, utilize this chat box anytime during the presentation um, and help us keep this conversation going. Because the goal is to really give y'all an insight to what does anti-oppression work look like on day-to-day -day practice. What are the realities? And we're gonna focus in three areas. We're gonna focus on the strengths and our successes. We're gonna focus on the barriers and the challenges, and then we're gonna focus on being sustainable. And what does it take to keep showing up day after day after day when the work looks and feels really difficult? So, um, so we're gonna start off with just a little conversation about intersectionality. And this is actually Sundal's slide, and this is her content. So. Um, I'm going to turn it over to her and let her start us off and just give us a little insight into what intersectionality means and how it looks like in her job. Sure. Hi, everyone. Um, first, I want to apologize. You're going to hear a lot of sound in my office because there is a lot of uh, construction happening, so I apologize for that. If I need to talk louder, please let me know, but I'm hoping everybody can hear me. Um, with that said, when I think about intersectionality, I think about the story that came with it, that, that kind of started off this whole concept. So there is a law pro professor, her, her name is a Kimberly Crenshaw, who coined this term. And when she was a lawyer, um, she had a client who was an employee at GM. And this is a long time ago in the 80s, about around that time. And her client was black and a woman, and she wanted to file a, a sexual harassment lawsuit against her employer. And their attorney said, you can't, you can't do both. You can't be black and you can't be a female who's trying to file this lawsuit, pick one. And that, like, in 2019 is so bizarre because you can indeed now file a lawsuit with both those identities as part of it. But in that time period for Crenshaw, she was just like, "How? why is this a thing? And so that's where this term comes from, is that there we, we all have identities that will intersect, right? It's like you're at a crossroads and the different parts of you do not just go away because of where you are or what's happening to you. Um, so with that said, Audrey Lord has a great quote, and I'm just going to read it off the slide. She said that there is no such thing as a single issue struggle because we do not live single issue lives. So a classic example I use when I train staff at our agency is I am South Asian. I am a female. I come from a family of, um, of all people who were not born in the U.S. who've had different struggles to get here. Um, I'm also queer. So those are all things that I bring to the table 
that you don't you don't get to hire just a part of me you hire that whole person and the way i do this work and the way i do programming is with all of that as part of me and on the flip side I, that is also how survivors come and receive services, right? That's how the folks that we serve navigate this world as well. So it's not just the providers who have to um, to really um, talk about that experience and really navigate spaces with that, but survivors come into organizations as people of color, as being queer, as being, you know, able in their own way. And those are things that we need to plan around and we need to accommodate their treatment plans for as well. So that's how I feel about that. <laughs> Yay. All right, Holly, do you want to go next? <laughs> oh. Can you hear me now? Can you hear me yes. now? <laughs> um, so just as Sundal was saying, I think this you know quote by Audre Lorde really does um, just incorporate what we're talking about with doing and integrating anti-oppression work because one of the ways that oppression really functions, especially in this work and um, in other um, ways as well, is to disconnect us from our personal experience, to disconnect us from our lived experiences. And that's where a lot of times you'll see that, oh, we provide the same services to everyone in the same way and we serve everyone. And those types of um, aspects are really a function of oppression because we cannot deny what, you know, our lived experiences and, and how we approach this work. And so that's always been a big piece of how I do this work. Um, you know, like Sundal said, you know, I'm a Persian, um, first generation Persian American, um, Iranian American, and um, I'm, you know, very aware of some of the um, pieces that come along with that and some of the perceptions that come along with that and some of the biases that come along with that. And, you know, I have to keep that in mind not only for what my views are and my biases are and how I may be presented to a potential client or survivor, but also, what does that mean for me and what are the policies in place? Um, so, you know, there's a lot of pieces of this that I think show up time and time again. And I think incorporating this knowledge, just this one quote just really hits home how we need to continue doing the work is just recognizing there's no such thing as single issue struggles. We are complex people. You can't just, one of the phrases I love is single story us. You know, you can't just put that all um, in one piece and say, this is how you provide this type of service or do this type of work. It all varies and keeping that in mind is a huge part of it. Yeah, I think this is a perfect transition for the next slide. Um, if I can get them to keep going for me. Like when we talk about that single story and then compare that to this image here, this isn't a single story issue. Um, you have all these different layers um, that come into play. So y'all wanna talk about this image and what y'all see when y'all think about it? Yeah, I mean, I think for me, I think about all like in the blue, that, that tends to be a traits that we all have that don't really change. I mean, you're, you're obviously for your age, it'll change over time, things like that. But I think the rainbow wheel part is what will change constantly for people as they age and grow older and things like that. Um, and I think it's helpful to, to keep in the front of your mind so we know and we acknowledge where we are in spaces and then where people come in as well and that there are certain traits on here that are a privilege and certain traits on here that are not always that positive, but it's something that we all carry with us. And when I say not positive, I mean in the current climate of this country, it leads to certain reactions. Um, so yeah, and I think also for me, part two of this is I keep I keep wanting to go back to for the, for the youth that we work with, uh, they carry this with them too, right? Especially when they come in and they're trying to get services with Chick so much courage they are in different parts of this wheel and as a provider if you're not understanding that or if you're not acknowledging that there are experiences that they have that you might not ever have that's that's going to be the first step for you to fully understand what it means to be doing anti-oppression work 
And I think there's a, a component to that there too that's really unique for young people because often they have to face so much ageism and adults telling them, even sometimes it, it appears like they have good intentions in telling them how to think about life, how to do life because they're still growing up, you know, and still pushing them out of their own lived experience of how they have experienced life, even though it hasn't been as many years as somebody that might be helping them. So I, you know, just adding to that, what y'all were talking just in general, what comes to mind for me is how often when, you know, decisions are made or policies are put in place, how little of this wheel that we actually tend to look at, you know, in the field, you know, we may say, you know, we're going to focus on um, age, you know, as y'all are talking about youth, you know, and how can we make these services more appropriate for age, but we only really look at maybe youth or, you know, or, you know, we don't look at the full spectrum of age and how that service may look different throughout that. Um, and then incorporating that outer circle as well. And so I, I love this image because I think it's a great one to come back to when it's like, hey, we want to change the way we do things. Well, mm -hmm. is that way going to benefit one part of this wheel, depending on, you know, how a person identifies or experiences life it, in more ways than another side of the wheel? And just really being able to think and get outside of that perspective that we may not always think about because it may not be our lived experience, but um, including people in the conversation that tries to um, represent more of this um, circle so we can provide more, um, you know, equitable approach, I guess. All right, so let's move through. Um, well, okay. Before we go to barriers and challenges, I, I like to start with positive. So let's talk about um, some of the strengths. I'm gonna go back to this, this Audrey Ward quote. Some of the strengths that y'all see within yourselves right now or in the last few years that have kept you looking forward in your work what's some what's some good stuff y'all got going on right now i'm i'm just gonna go first um i think a strength for me this is really cheesy is being able to see for the youth i work with seeing the outcomes which is a big privilege to have because in some direct service work you don't get to see the outcome depending on where people are in stages of change but even the small achievements of like enrolling in a ged class like finding child care for her kid because in how she's able to get employment and keep employment that has really helped me um to go through and on more personal note like having a squad of friends who actually understand what I do and being able to vent about work and then just keeping it there and having experiences with them that isn't about work. I think so often we make friends because of the work that we do. And then when we hang out, it's always about the work that we do. And so having people that set a boundary and saying that like, we're going to talk for an hour and then we're going to go and enjoy life because I'm going to be honest, there's more to life than just the work that we do. Mm -hmm. um, and that's what helps me to keep going is that I will work as hard as the people I'm serving are working because at the end of the day, I cannot do life for them. And that's something that I have learned the very hard way and continue to keep learning. So I hear you on that, Sundal. <laughs> and I think that's like a lifelong thing if we're going to stay in this work. So I feel that. Um, you know, I'll be real, when, when uh, Crystal was like, let's talk about positive first, because it really is, it's so hard to sometimes think of those successes because this work is hard, but I think we're all still here and doing the work, and I think that's a success in, a, in and of itself, because as hard as it is sometimes and discouraging, because sometimes we don't see the results we want as quick as we want or, or anything, or people don't listen, but we're still here doing the work. Um, and you know, throughout my career, I mean, I started in about in 2008 as a volunteer, an intern, and was able to kind of move my way up um, when I worked at the Turning Point Rape Crisis Center. And I do feel like I was able to raise some awareness while I was there about this this issue that we're talking about about doing anti-oppression work, um, even though I didn't really have the terms back then. Um, just being able to say, you know, this 
we don't have any bilingual staff. We need to have bilingual staff, you know, and, and starting to incorporate some of those conversations. Um, and we now have, a, you know, in, in Collin County, a clinic that's based within the um, within the turning point, which was a huge thing while we were, while I was going on hospital commitments and talking with advocates about survivors who were continuously re-victimized at the hospital because of their identities, because of their lived experience, because of how they showed up and the assumptions people had. And um, I'm not saying the clinic gets rid of all of that, but it's a step. And I've seen some positive outcomes from it and some survivors share with me how much that experience meant to them and which is just way different than hearing about survivors talk about some of their hospital-based experiences. So that's definitely been a success. Um, and then for me, you know, being board president in, is like something I never thought would be possible. And when I started this work, like Crystal said, I um, joined Diversity Task Force, which is what Voices is now, and connected with a lot of staff and um, other people in the field doing this work as a person of color and you know was mentored and had the ability to connect with friends and and people that get get it and um helped kind of renew my spirit and motivate me to do better and keep learning and um you know and it, it feels really awesome to be able to say you know we you know in a time when especially um, when you hear about Iranians or, you know, people from Middle Eastern backgrounds, it's not always in a positive context. Mm -hmm. So to be able to add that visibility to the board truly like, you know, makes, you know, hits me home. And, and I hope that that, um, you know, other people see that and can kind of have those goals too in the future. So, yeah. Uh, it's always good to have a good friend that knows when to send a cat meme too. So Holly's really good about that. <laughs> she has the best ones. <laughs> Got your back with that. All right. So now let's let's get real. This is the real stuff. I mean, this is the stuff that leads to burnout. It leads to all sorts of sorts of drama and and all sorts of fun stuff. But it's it's very present. And um, I know last week we talked a lot about um, this work is long term work. Um, it's a marathon, it's not a sprint, and um, sustainability is a big issue, but we also have to be very realistic that there are some barriers, there are some challenges to integrating a different framework, a different way of seeing clients getting past that kind of equal services, everybody gets the same thing um, approach, or, you know, I know about different cultures, so please trust me and, and just do what I want you to do. Um, so time obviously is a big issue in here um a lot of times it feels like anti-oppression work is so foreign it's such a big concept um it's theoretical it takes a lot of brain power and typically we have more tasks in our day than we have time so it gets put on the back burner i want to get to that i'm trying to get to that and it just we haven't made it yet yeah, that's something we need to do, but, and then we just kind of go, go, go. So we're usually just like putting out fires, right? And it feels like we're herding cats, which is a favorite saying among Voices members. Um, so uh, money is also a realistic, uh, you know, feeling like we have limitations in terms of grants or donors or, or however that is going to look for our particular organization um, and being strategic with what we're spending on. Um, or, and it's just feeling like we can't afford to make radical changes. We, usually we can, but um, the logic and the feeling are sometimes in conflict with each other. Um, the next one is really big, and this one affects everybody in an organization um, not understanding what anti-oppression means and how to put it into practice. Um, not everybody is able to or willing to take the time to learn about this. Um, and study it or come to training. Um, so we constantly find ourselves working with people across the board or stakeholders or um, just different people in different positions of leadership that are making decisions that we might not necessarily be able to make. And everybody's at this different level of knowledge. And so it feels like there's conflict. Um, and then that conflict does lead to stress and it can lead to toxic environments. So the outcome for that is that we do run out of energy. We do feel overwhelmed. Um, we do get tired. We do get burnout. Um, 
And then I think as a woman of color also doing this work, there's also been times when I've experienced self-doubt and questioned, you know, my knowledge or, or how do, can I really do this work? Can I really make a difference? Um, as a survivor, there's been points when I've, I know over the last, you know, 15, 16 years I've been doing this, I've asked, like, what is the point? What is the point of doing this? I'm, I'm still seeing it feels like sometimes the same case over and over and over again. So um, we do lose that will, like we get really tired sometimes. Um, and then um, the next piece of this is feeling like we're doing the work alone, feeling like um, we're pushing back um, against even, you know, a leadership or a stakeholder, a community that doesn't feel like they're ready, um, just feeling like, am I the only one thinking like this? Like, I see this, I feel this, I experience this, um, but it feels like I'm completely isolated and wanting to make this change and wanting to build programs that are more inclusive or do something differently. Um, and then, that ends up leading us to, which is the center graphic here, um, just being afraid, being afraid we can't accommodate people, being afraid we're going to make a mistake, being afraid we're going to lose our position, our status, our privilege. And that comes out of the fact that oppression thrives on people having power. It thrives on people being in that kind of dominant group, making those decisions and deciding what that social norm is. And then anything outside of it being the definition of diversity. So when we start bringing in new stuff, um, there is a paralyzing fear of what's, what am I going to lose? What's the potential here? Um, so that's something that you are constantly looking out for. So, all right, ladies. So let's talk about the blind man and the elephant, um, which is where we're starting off with it, which is uh, working with people who don't have the same level of understanding, different places in their knowledge and experience. So this is a pretty um, old proverb about six blind men who are asked to touch an elephant. Each of them is touching a different piece of the elephant. So it leads them to describe six different objects, a snake, a rug, a spear, a tree, a wall, and a rope. Mm -hmm. um, ultimately, the men fight, 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 fight because they're all touching the same animal. They just have no idea. Um, so each of them has a different perspective. Each of them is right. And at the same time, each of them is bringing something wrong to the discussion. So um, my question for you ladies is, have you ever been in a situation like this? Yeah. <laughs> Holly, do you want to go first? Well, I was just curious and if people wanted to chat in the, the chat box and you don't have to, if you don't want to give a description, but I just kind of wanted to also survey those on the call. Like, can anyone else relate to this, this feeling that, you know, what, you know, we're not, we're not talking about the same thing right now or your solution's not actually correct or, you know, any of those senses. Um, if y'all want to chat in. So far, there's nothing coming in, but I'm sure people have opinions. Here comes something. Alex says, absolutely. And Sean says, yes. So you're on yeah. the right track. You know this. How do you want to proceed? <laughs> yes. Yes. We, I think, you know, I think that is a real challenge and some of it, you know, if I'm self-reflecting, I think, which a big part of doing anti-oppression work, I feel like is having the ability to like check myself and, you know, see like, okay, what is going on here? Because most often, I mean, when I've experienced this, I feel like it's not someone with more like, per, you know, insight than I, usually I feel like it's someone with less knowledge or experience doing the work that when I'm like, no, like, please don't. And that's just be me, me being real. Cause most, I feel like there's a lot more times um, that I've had conversations with people where I'm like, wow, like I wanna learn more from this person. I wanna seek out more knowledge from this person. And that usually isn't an issue. Like I feel like I, I do well in those, but when, someone maybe perspective I feel like is problematic or not based in the same 
um, mentality that I think or the same path that I think I, it needs to go um, to make it happen, I, I struggle. And that's been a big piece of my work is figuring out how, you know, obviously if they're talking about it, if they're recognizing some of the, um, you know, the marginalization that goes on and they're, and they're wanting to be involved, because a lot of times I think this does come up with people who want to be involved and want to help with that change is what can I do to connect with them and have that conversation and realize that maybe I can learn something from them because ultimately we have to do this work together. And like Crystal had mentioned on part one, you know, all oppression is connected and, um, you know, they could be a, they could be an ally and they could, you know, help create this change. And so what, what, can I do to see what part of the elephant that they're connecting with and what their perspective is, but also still not, um, still also protect myself and protect my truth and other, you know, pieces that, you know, sometimes when the um, validation piece or the not validation, but the not, um, I don't know, like the blindness can happen is where um, some of that struggle also comes in. But now I'm babbling, so I'm just going to. Pass it over to you, Sundal. <laughs> and I just wanted to add one thing. There's a comment here. It says, yes, especially when values don't yeah. align. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, I think Helen, who, who put that comment in, brings up a really good point. And uh, it's aligned with what Hollis said. I think there's a lot packed into this image and this question. I think um, I'm very frank, so I'm just going to speak freely with understanding this will be on YouTube. Um, <laughs> So I think when it comes to anti-oppression work and you have people who um, self-proclaim that they're an ally and then you have people who have been doing this work for so long, like I'm talking about like 20 plus years. And so you want to learn from them, but you're also like, wow, you have not caught up. And I'm not saying that's everybody, that's my personal experience, but I, at my agency, I train people on anti-oppression work. I train them as speaking for communities of color because I'm the only person who will do it at this agency. That's what I do. So I get to really hear what people think about what it means when you say um, all lives matter or I don't see color. And that's kind of what this image brings up to me is people are defensive about anti-oppression work. They see the back end of this image, right? Where they are thinking, don't call me racist, don't call me homophobic, like that's not me. And they're not hearing or not seeing the full picture. And so I th and there's also a piece of where they don't want to understand. I've always said like sometimes you have to leave people behind because they haven't caught up or they don't want to catch up. And I say that with complete compassion. I don't know if it's worth my time to sit here and try to change your opinion all i can do is challenge this and hope that maybe somebody else that you're closer to or you read a book or something happens that changes your mind about what anti-oppression work means because all of it does matter um i had a coworker who we were talking about immigration and i have then learned that i will never bring it up again at the workplace um especially in the current climate and she made a comment using a certain word i'm like and i'm walking away from this conversation because i thought we didn't use that word since like the 80s but it's good to know that we still do that um and so i think when it comes to this graphic different people see different things and some folks will change their mind and some folks unfortunately need more um more stories more experience um which i don't think you need if you you know believe in humanity and equal rights and all that stuff so that's how i feel about that image do you you for for y'all who are on on this training um do uh, y'all have any uh, thoughts about this um the, his specific image or how it applies to the work that you do Well, people are typing in, I just want to add, Sundal, when you were saying that, um, you know, I think that's a really real part is, you know, like Crystal said, this is a marathon, not a sprint, and recognizing what what can I realistically accomplish. I, one of the things that we've had um, at the police department, which 
secret. It's a really hard place to do anti-oppression work. Just going to put that out there. But um, I know it's a surprise and shock to everybody. But um, but that, I'm not saying it's there's every environment is hard to do it in. But we had a huge one of the huge conversations is officers removing their shoes before walking into a household where um, you know if the if the couple is Muslim like that's that's a respectful practice and that's something that growing up in my household is a, is a big thing and when it mm -hmm. safety is not a huge concern there are a lot of solutions that you could do to implement that and there was a group that was huge pushback like you said Sundal that they're like well what about my religious beliefs you know why and it's like well your religious beliefs don't say I think that you have to wear shoes all the time like you know we're not saying to convert we just recognize that you want to make connection with people respecting their home respecting their you know um you know their beliefs is an important piece and so some groups I knew we were you know as much as I tried to educate or you know share experiences it didn't change anything and but there were a few that said well I could what about, you know, putting shoe covers on at least, you know, what's a compromise? How can we come up with it? And so I think that's always going to be, be a big piece too is, you know, it is a marathon and what can I instill? And if it doesn't, you know, plant or whatever, then I'm not good with planting analogies because I don't do well with that. But um, if it doesn't stick, that doesn't mean it's something I did wrong. Um, but it's just, you know, that's, it's not going to change with that person, but maybe it'll with, hopefully others. I think to that point as well, like that is a small example of what it could be. And I think that's when like anti-oppression work seems so big. It feels like it needs to be this big policy change, this big overhaul. And in reality, it's things like that where you ask law enforcement to take their shoes off or put shoe covers on. Um, we have a guard who will, in the beginning of having this program for youth, my old, old leadership, and I say old as in like, they're not here anymore, but, um, and they wanted the armed security officer to sit in this center. And I'm like, so you have primarily youth of color who've been, have had really terrible experience with law enforcement. You want an armed security guard who is a male to sit in a program for only youth, specifically girls. Does that make sense to you? And it, they, they took a long time for them to fully understand what I was trying to say until I started saying youth are leaving. They see the logo of the sheriff's office and they're walking out the door and they're not coming back. And so I need you to make some kind of change. So we acknowledge that we need security because we're open so late, but we also need to know that an armed white male security guard is not the safest person to be in this center right now. Um, and so those are tiny steps that you can take that you can try to, to advocate for your program, for your agency, for your team, and that is considered anti-oppression work. It doesn't need to be a full overhaul of your team or training or anything like that. It's acknowledging who you're serving, what you're doing, who's on your team, all of that to make sure that you're um, trying to resonate with the people that you're working with. Mm -hmm. I think one of my favorite activists, she she works in the body positivity movement, but she, she talks about oppression. One of the things she is constantly saying is, we didn't cause this system we can't cure it and we can't control it. And sometimes it feels like when we're doing anti-oppression work, we're doing it from the perspective of trying to control it or trying to cure it. And that's not something one single person or one single view can do. Um, and letting go of, I have to control this, even though I'm a perfectionist, I'm messy and I have ADHD, but <laughs> when it comes to my ideas, I'm very much a perfectionist. And it's like, this is right. And this is how I see it. And you know, I can dig down. So, you know, and coming back and, and kind of, like Holly said, reassessing and saying what's really going on here. Um, that's hard work because giving up, you know, privilege is, is very uncomfortable at times because you benefit from it. I mean, why would you give it up if it's something you benefit from? So, mm -hmm. all right. Do we have any audience questions before we move to the next section? None that have come in so far. So if y'all are interested and want to ask a question, please chat it in. 
That's what we're here for today. Chat it yeah. in. We can it's also it. unmute you, but if, if you're uncomfortable speaking on the mic, I get it. Um, we'll take questions either way. And feel free to please comment, you know, throughout too. If there's, you know, things we can read your comments, you know, um, insight, something you just feel like you have, you want to share, you know, in this, in this space too, where that's also what we're here for. One more thing about the elephant, um, you know, also kind of made me realize as we're, you know, all the, all the different perspectives of having a safe environment and that, that being a big piece of, and I know we're going to talk about surviving this work later is, you know, I, I know that there are people that I can say, hey, can I talk to you for a minute and have the conversation about, you know, your snake that you saw versus, you know, how you shared about this experience or, um, you know, didn't didn't hit home for me or I, I felt hurt by that or, or whatever it is on how it's impacting the work, you know, especially the larger work as a whole. I know, Crystal, you, you and I have talked about this. Um, when the shaming that sometimes goes on with sexuality, you know, and in some areas that's hard for people who've been in the movement maybe for a while to recognize that um, having your own sexual agency is not a bad thing, you know, and that's a different perspective. And some people want to talk more about a different perspective of that. And who are the people that you can safely pull aside and have that conversation with and who are the ones you, you can't. And I just, Again, focusing on the ones we can, I think that's a great part of the blind man and elephant thing is sometimes we can have those conversations and how do we build trust to figure out who those people are, if that makes sense. Oh, we have a comment. Okay. Helen just asked a great question. Okay, yes. here's are <laughs> reading it. Maybe you'll get into this later, but what are the best practices for incorporating racial justice and decriminalization framework into our anti-sexual violence work for those of us who have been trying to center anti-oppression oppression values into the work in that way. Wow. Um, <laughs> who wants to start? No pressure. <laughs> I'm laughing because I kind of want to meet Helen. <laughs> you do. Uh, Helen. <laughs> Come chat with us, Helen. <laughs> I like this question is so big because I feel like it's an ongoing process and I liked your language Helen of not only the racial component but de criminalization like those two things are so synced and have always been and I think if we're genuinely going to be doing anti um anti-oppression work we need to be talking about that and so the first step for me is something I've try to incorporate wherever I work is the place that you work needs to acknowledge and publicly recognize that the the work that they do is linked to um, a mass incarceration, to immigration, to LGBTQIA issues. And so when there is a shooting in your area or in the country, you release a public statement about it because a big part of that is making sure leadership understands that this shooting is not unrelated to the work that we're doing. And that's something, I'm going to be totally honest, a lot of places do not do that. They do not mm -hmm. want to get involved. It's not my lane. I don't get grant funding for that. That's my favorite answer when you bring it up is we don't get funding for that. We can't speak on that. All we're talking about is acknowledgement of that because it does link to the work that we're doing. So that to mm -hmm. me is the first step in trying to center anti-oppression work in your overall work that you're doing is really acknowledging how it links to every other facet of what's going on in your community and then overall in the country. Um, I'm gonna pause there because I wanna think about part two of what I'm gonna say. Go ahead, Holly. Okay. Well, Seth Wong said, this is where, where quote, allies are crucial. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I love you. Everybody nodding. Let's, let's <laughs> yeah. We're yeah. about to get into that slide content as we move to the next. I'm going to let Holly answer, and then uh, we're going to get into some conversation about aspiring allies. <laughs> yes. Um, and, you know, this is a huge question and so complex and so real. I think 
I can't say I know for sure a, a best practice, but I will say I think back to kind of what we were talking about earlier that there's no one way to do this work and just being open to that and in whatever way you can incorporate it, like Sunol was saying, like making comments on it, making your agency having stances on it. Um, but I, I think also we can't do this work alone. Um, one, because I, you know, I know that decriminalization is, you know, a huge thing and how that's all, all connected, but I don't have all of the research or knowledge or expertise. Who can I seek out that could be an, you know, supporter for me in that? maybe a true ally in that, um, or even educating myself, but it's, I feel like it's so much easier when you have, or are, are able to get support from your community um, in that and get buy-in truly helps. Um, but just going, I think, back to what can you do, like start there and hopefully go forward. And I think policies, I mean, we are in a system that was built to oppress. I mean, it's truly, our systems were built that way. And so finding out where in that system you can have change to slowly um, incorporate anti-oppression work is, is a big thing. And if you have the ability to change policies and practice, it can, it can definitely be a good starting place. I have two thoughts, because I want to make sure that we give like a tangible, like what can you go back to your agency and do? And the first thought I have is from the bottom up. So if you are in a position or you know someone who trains new employees or does trainings at your agency, ask them and start to incorporate like what anti-oppression is, why this links, if you want the the people that we use and even small things like that that way the people that you work with are aligned with you because that's that's going to be a big part of it um part two of that also is if you're in direct service um, i'm currently in the process of re um re-evaluating our program we'll be open for two years next year and so i'm interviewing all the youth regardless of how long they're in the program to get feedback. And I'm curious if that might be a good way for you to frame a question about like, how well do you feel like the work that we do, you know, intersects with other facets of your life? And you might have to expand more about like, you know, who they are. Say you work, like a lot of the people I work with have a background, they've been incarcerated. And so that's definitely a question that we ask. Like, do you think we're really doing anything towards that? And you have to, to, to compile that and take it to your leadership and say, hey, this is what we're not doing. Like, do you actually want to make a difference in the, in the overall view of what this means and, and help this whole entire human? Or do you only want to focus on the sexual violence piece and let everything else that this person needs go? And that it's easier said than done. I It sounds super idealistic, but if you want to chat more about that offline, feel free to, because that's what I'm doing right now. And I'm not going to lie, it's very overwhelming, but it is super helpful when you have white leadership who wants data and they want information and they want quantitative and qualitative content of why do you think we should do this? Cool, I will tell you why you think we, why I think we should be doing this because that's what the people we're serving are telling me we should be doing. And ultimately, if we were a survivor informer driven, that's what we would do, right? Um, and it's, it's not an easy conversation to have. And I think that's where having true allies come in to back you up, to support you. Um, I have a supervisor who is white who will point blank be like, I'll be in the room. You just say what you have to say and then I'll say it again and let's see how it goes because we both know when it comes from me, she needs to say it again for it to be heard in certain places. And so those are two tangible ways that you could begin to be talking about it. And then also there is um, a, a model from the East Coast. It's called, it's called the SAFE program. And they promote the sanctuary model for all agencies from the bottom to the top, where they want from the board to the person who is, you know, on the hotline calls to be trained in uh, in this model of trauma informed care in every aspect of what your work is. Um, and that training is very expensive, but it's also online. So feel free to search that to see if it'd be a good fit um, for what you're trying to do at your agency. Mm -hmm. All right, let me get our slides to move for us. Okay, so 
allyship. We're going to get into this conversation. Um, because of the way the system of oppression works, um, its goal is to push out any voice or any lived experience that looks different from the dominant experience. So even in coming in to do the work, um, there can be times, especially when it comes to microaggressions, when those of us doing the work get pushed out or um, allies can sometimes fall short, even with the best intention. So that's something I just wanna take a little bit of time here to acknowledge and to talk through um, when allies have felt short and it, it's left you feeling alone. And then as the follow-up to that, what would you want allies to know? Because this social justice work is best done in groups, in alignment. We've said that over and over and over again. Um, how do we get to alignment? Um, so who wants to go first with that one? <laughs> I can I can go. Well, I think, yes. Have I ever experienced a time where an ally fell short? M many a times. Um, and I think this is part of just to, you know, not, not to always focus on the next, but just to be real, this is part of what makes this work so hard is to have policy changes, to have um, the anti-oppression framework incorporated into your agency, your community and all that, you have to have an ally that's willing to, like Sundell said, come with you to a meeting or to wherever and say, yeah, like, this is real. We need to do this. And um, because of some of those barriers that you mentioned earlier, um, Crystal is, I think, losing power, the potential of losing power is really difficult. Um, I've had a lot of um, supervisors who are white women and I've experienced the trend of it when it benefits them um, and fits within this comfortable framework of maybe this will help us get more funding because we're saying we're doing culturally specific services or, or whatnot then they're on board but then when it comes to okay but look at this practice of um, you know, even as, as simple as sometimes our office space uh, and what norms are we creating in this office space and who are our clients? You know, when we look at our census data, we only serve pretty much 80% white women. You know, why? Like, can we figure out why? What is, what model are we not taking? Why are we just expecting people to come to us? You know, when we start to ask those hard questions, and then all of a sudden it's like, well, that sounds like a great idea. Yeah, we need to do that, but I'm not gonna give you any of the support to do it. And I'm not going to talk to the board about the importance of doing it. I'm not gonna help that action or I'll even shut down your idea. Um, you know, that becomes really hard and it feels really lonely sometimes because um, I think for many of us, and I don't know if this is experience of people on the call, for many of us, sometimes we are that one token person that is the one that always brings it up. And so when it benefits the agency, they'll come to us and say, how do we do this? But other than that, our own ideas aren't necessarily supported. And that's, I mean, that's been my experience and I'm sure other people can relate to that. So yes, that's, that is hard. And sometimes we're not in the position. I mean, I know that there are people that are in positions of power that I, I could lose my job and I don't have the luxury of not having a job um, because it's hard to, you know, be employed full time and um, have benefits and all of those things. So um, it can feel really discouraging, really alone. It can make it hard to want to continue this work sometimes when we have those things come up. So yes, um, I'll start with just that, answering that question. Those are some examples of, of times. <laughs> <laughs> I, I mean, you bring up a good point the electric bill comes no matter what like I mean, we can try to tell them we we help people but they don't listen so <laughs> right yeah please um don't you know that i do good work please don't turn off my electricity or my <laughs> <laughs> so. i've experienced this in different ways where um there have been well i'm as holly was talking and she said she's had a lot of uh, supervisors who were a white woman i was like i think all my supervisors in this work have been white women i'm not saying that there's anything wrong with that i don't want people to only take away like we're targeting white folks that again is not what we're saying or doing um 
And it's habitual for me to say that, which is also a problem. Like every time I walk into a room and I turn, I'm like, I'm not attacking because I don't want people to take away or only hear that, which is something we can unpack later. But um, <laughs> something I thought about is when you're supervised by a white superior, um, your ideas don't become your own. I've learned the hard way to be very careful about what ideas I present to the people I work with, because if I am not allowed to do them, I come back the following day or week and interesting, where'd you get that idea from? I should have copyrighted that, damn it. Like, and you, like, your ideas are gone and they're being presented or taken away by somebody else. And um, they use snippets of what you said. I'm like, I literally asked to do that. And okay, like, good to know that it wasn't, that I wasn't the face that you wanted. Um, and to Hala's point of they come and ask you as the token um, representative of whatever community you are from, right? Um, and so you become the spokesperson and they don't fully understand like, why can't you just speak on this issue? Because that I'm not going to speak for every person that may share part of the uh part of who i am that's not what i'm here for mm -hmm. um i also think it's very interesting when you say that and they're like oh i totally understand i grew up in the south and i'm like okay here we go here we go <laughs> cool good to know um so that's kind of been my experience and then part two of that is um feeling like you are invalid or what you say becomes invalidated um, by uh, by coworkers or supervisors who are white, who don't have that same shared experience, but then will go and say that they're an ally. Like that's been super confusing for me where they don't wanna hear why the shooting in El Paso was such a big deal and why we need to put out a public statement about that. But then they'll go and say, when we're doing a diversity inclusion training that, hey, I am an ally. I'm like, so you're actually not. You should wait for people to tell you that you're an ally and have, have them give you that title versus you claiming it yourself. And that's why for the comment that had like the quotation allies, it's been really disheartening to find out that people that you trusted didn't actually put that face up everywhere they went. They only used that when it was convenient for them. Mm -hmm. So. Yeah, I, I use the the safety pin example, you know, it's a little older now, but it was relevant at a point, you know, when we were all wearing our safety pins and trying to advertise ourselves as safe people. And then you hear somebody wearing a safety pin saying something that you're like, yeah, yeah, yeah that just, you know, completely in contradiction, but it's difficult to go say something about it. Um, Oh yes, capitalization, raising funds for mainstream organizations. Oh. Yep. Yes. Yep. <laughs> yep. <laughs> uh, yep. The, the safety yeah. pin plays in perfectly. I think somebody was selling a a safety pin necklace for like a thousand dollars on Etsy or something. And yeah. I'm like, what? <laughs> like, I don't have a thousand dollars. I'm paying my rent with that. Um. So yeah, <laughs> it's just it, it's hard, and then it's hard to come back to that person, especially if they're a person in a position of leadership or uh, they hold more power in a situation and say, when you said this, it made me feel, but I'm wearing a safety pin, right. you know, or, but I'm have this or that, or that, or, you know, I went to this training, you must trust me. So, yeah. um, mm -hmm. and that's the constant struggle. And, and mm -hmm. I get it. I get how that connects to us burning out and losing our will to keep wanting to push the work forward. So. I think also to that point, it's your intention versus your impact. And I think sometimes allies really struggle with that concept of my favorite example is when you grew up in privilege. And of course, you don't choose that, but it's just the life that you led and you want to give back. You want to engage in philanthropy, in philanthropy in a way that suits you, right? Because it's not actually fully altruistic. It's something that you it helps you feel better, whatever it is. And so you give or you interact with 
with nonprofits on your terms and you are not open to feedback from the agency saying like that's not how we do this or we can't have you come in during our main operating hours and lead a community tour of 30 people even if you're going to write a check of two million dollars like oh but i did this training and you know i really care about your cause cool love that you do but that's not how we do this and then some folks do not have agency support and they'll leadership who have the strength to say, actually, yeah, that's not how we do this. I'm not going to allow this to happen because it's not trauma informed. And if we truly care about who we serve, we're not going to engage in that behavior. And that, again, goes back to fundraising and development and um, token tokenizing survivors to get the money. Right. Um, and whether it's in instagram stories or whatever it is like that it all goes back to are you a true ally um and not only an ally for poc and queer folks but like are you an ally for survivors and ultimately i mean i don't know we could we could talk about that for a long time and see mm -hmm. how people truly interact as allies for survivors and um see what they genuinely could do to be a, an ally versus someone who claims that identity mm -hmm. All right, so any questions or other comments from our audience members? The conversation is getting real today. <laughs> they are, and at this point, I think people are mulling over everything you said, because I don't see any more in the chat box. Y'all are paying attention, and I appreciate everybody chatting in. I'm ready to hear more. Mm -hmm. Crystal, you had said something, we kind of talked about this, uh, yesterday too with um, that safety and that trust and I suddenly you touched on it too with allies who um, have that expectation of trust from us that mm -hmm. they they're still being allies and what they're doing we should just trust them not supporting mm -hmm. this or that because they've been to that training they've you know yeah. they, they know all of those things did y'all want to um, touch more about that because I think that's a a real part of this conversation is that um not so real trust or that expectation of yeah trust. like and, and because we have when we're working with vulnerable people we do ha hold that power in that relationship and so i know for me there is you know at, at times and especially when i first started out a lot of the way i approached the work was i am a survivor mm -hmm. i am a survivor of campus sexual violence which still has some privilege in and of itself a little bit i experienced it a little bit differently because you know i still brought a fat body to that situation where you know it was impossible to imagine somebody wanting to sexually assault a body that looked like the one i was in at that time um so it was like you know who do we, you should be grateful that somebody even wanted to touch you like that's the kind of response i got so learning how to even work with people and say well i'm a survivor so i understand what you've been through too even giving up that perspective and learning nobody owes me trust because I love the work that I do. Mm -hmm. um, and, and that's oppressive in and of itself. So, and I love us continuing to have this conversation about um, passing the mic and, you know, stopping us saying things like, I'm a voice for the voiceless. Um, <laughs> people have a voice, like <laughs> let them use it, get out of the way. So, <laughs> so. I appreciate you sharing that, Chris. So that's being super, vulnerable online and like really i'm really impressed that you shared that in a non-condescending way i apologize um i also in full transparency i'm not a survivor um i come in this work because like i really give a shit to be honest and um coming from a background of being south asian where this happens continuously every day to hundreds and thousands of people then it goes un unreported um and to Crystal's point, that trust piece of like, I the feeling that you get when someone shows their true colors, I'm like, dang it, I thought like, I thought we had it. Like, I thought you understood. And like, I was telling people that like, you were with me and you were with us, you were an ally. And I'm like, great, like I, now I know, right? Now I know. Um, and I, I think that goes to like, 
what is like why how do you address it do you address that um is it more helpful to have someone who is a true ally address someone who is not who claims to be one is that more effective than having a person of color going and doing that emotional labor of saying like hey this is wrong this is what should have been the response let's talk about i genuinely don't know which one would be more effective i know which one i would want to do um so that also kind of to add into that conversation and we've got a com we've got several comments one from kate meals who says y'all are awesome and thank you for spread uh, for speaking i have to push this down on these issues and shining a light which is i think really important and olivia whitley has said all of this hits so close to home, especially at our facility that house, quote, community specific, unquote, outreach projects. But the majority of our clients are still cis hetero uh, white women. There's been no internal reflection on why the people we serve aren't actually reflective of our, quote, community approach. And the next one from Kenya Williamson is, have you ever been a spokesperson for your job because you looked more like the population they wanted you to serve? Then they try to clean it up by saying you have experience with that population, but deep down, you know, it's because you are a person of color. Ladies, I see you. <laughs> um, we've opened up another uh, avenue of discussion. I'm leaving you to it. Those Which are all question do we want to address first? Yeah. Where do we want to start? <laughs> no, I think, you know what, let's start with, um, because I think this speaks to some of the conversations we've had about bringing in grant monies to serve different communities, but not really being intentional about it, just thinking we can use the same best practice approach. Um, so let's start with that, um, the community specific outreach and then move forward from there. So who wants to start? I'll, I'll say, Olivia, I mean, I think this, yes, I mean, that's part of one the distrust issue that comes up with our our leadership is do you have leadership or even just even, even if they're not above you so i mean there's that hierarchy piece but um but people in your agency that are willing to take a look and actually see why they aren't serving the community that they're in and i think one of the struggles i have is sometimes when i've, I've brought this up in the past um with multiple agencies um, that I've done work with and it's a reaction from being defensive like well of course we are yes we are serving our community you know and and that shift blame that happens when we're trying to further oppress people and ignore responsibility of well if they wanted services they would come here so obviously they must be getting services somewhere else which is great because they're being served so um and and that is a tough tough thing when that internal actual internal reflection isn't willing to uh, be had and like Sundell mentioned earlier um typically a lot of people in leadership positions want that research and data because that's the you know that's the way to do things um but we don't want to look at the research and data as far as who we're actually serving and who's being left out and um i always have found that you know very hypocritical but you know how to figure out how to bring that research to the table and doing that work on your own and and um not on your own but getting with people in the community that can support you and doing that but yeah that is a real real piece and i think that's why this oppression continues and why it's so important that we integrate it into our work yet again because we have to continue to have that reflection and be willing to say this is not okay you know we're not we're not reaching that and we need to do better um and yeah and those can be tough conversations for people to have if they don't want to hear it or see it 
I mean, we like serving safe clients. I'm just going to be totally like upfront mm -hmm. and say that. I think um, that gives comfort to people that like those clients will not bring quote unquote danger. They're easier to work with. They have more drive. All of the stereotypes that you have for POC survivors, POC clients and in, in whatever capacity, there's an understanding or an idea that they're easier to work with than um, someone who's a person of color. And I think that's really honestly unfair and that says a lot about the bias that we have towards um other people and so uh my favorite thing to say that it's not a coincidence either way if you're serving primarily poc or primarily white folks like neither of those things are a coincidence and if we're looking at the uh the risk factors that put someone at higher risk for any type of violence it is not someone who is white. It's not. Now, in I'm not saying it won't happen, but if you're looking at the holistic view of all of the factors that predispose someone to that type of abuse and violence, there is a certain a population who's higher at risk. And that's why like for trafficking, for example, when people tell me everybody's at risk, actually, no, they're not. Otherwise, we would serve all the youth in this area, and we actually don't. Um, and I say that with complete love for everybody out there, but the reality of it is, is that we serve primarily youth who are Latinx and Black, right? because of where zip codes run, because of where schools are, because of how like unemployment goes, all of that. And so I think if we're going to be genuine about how we do community approach work, we need to say that, and we need to acknowledge that you're bringing in certain people and that they're they're receiving services somewhere else. Have you created a, 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 a program that has a lot of steps to get to? Is it low barrier or high barrier? Um, are you able to work with communities to meet them where they're at? And if you're not willing to, then maybe it's time to refer out or to partner with other agencies that will do that work. Um, and it's not it's not fair to advertise that you're serving certain communities when you're serving percentages of certain communities. So um, I definitely feel that and understand that. And I think um, I live in Dallas. That's where our program is run is in Dallas. We're close to a train station. And so we have the privilege of having transportation close by. We also have vans that run to go and get youth to come to our center. And so your question really has me think of places that are further out that are more rural. How are they serving their communities and what what evaluation is being done, right? Of who you're serving, how you're serving them, and what are the gaps in services there? All right, so we've had some stuff added to the chat box. Um, from from JJ, I'm sorry, from Juan, <coughs> Jose Juan, it's important to remind ourselves it's not just about the individual, but the systems that support oppression. <laughs> Often we talk about allies. When we talk about allies, it becomes about, quote, well, we have friends who are, unquote and then from pam bets it's what about when our quote allies are people of color but they have a different agenda that does not incorporate the whole good question and again from jose juan it is and getting funding to do so and not sharing in the funding with culturally specific organizations mm -hmm. who do provide culturally mm -hmm. responsive services. And on that note, we hear the siren to indicate uh, I, I, that this I, I, is I really imagine important. a more appropriately timed siren. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> we did not plan that. <laughs> it was good. Lady, yeah. take it away. I wanted to go back to that question that was asked by Kenya about being the spokes spokesperson for your job because you resemble the population that you serve. And then they try to clean it up with saying it's because the experience that you have with that population, which sounds like it makes it worse to be honest, because like they're making assumptions about what you do or how you live. Um, 
I'm going to be honest, like I am South Asian and I do not resemble the population that we're serving. Now, if I worked at an agency that survived, that served survivors of trafficking who were international survivors, that would probably be the case. Um, however, um, I'm going to be really careful about how I wear this. I hope nobody else from my agency watches this. I supervise the only team of color at this agency. All of them, except for two people, are all women of color. And I think, and we're all direct service, and we all work with you. And I think that's really, really interesting. And I hired half the team, and it was not intentional. And it, it just happened to be that way. And I, I'm always very protective and very careful because I'm like, do not ask my team to do things that you would not ask any other team to do at this age. That's not how I operate. That's not how we do this work. Um, and there have been comments from my team where it's like, we handle so many crises and tough encounters that kind of go unnoticed. There's an attitude of, well, y'all don't really do anything anyways, because we have a program that is some days really busy and some days not because the girls will drop in at any point in time no appointments required and so when you have that lens on a whole team of color it makes us operate a certain way and so yes i think in a different way we've experienced that um at, at my at my previous jobs where um we did serve folks who were south asian or asian i did feel like i was a spokesperson i think i felt like i was more of like ask her she'll give you um the quote that you need about diversity and inclusion i get that a lot especially because i'm the person who trains on this issue at my agency i love doing it but it gets draining after a while but at the same time i don't want anybody else to do it right so um there's also that component all right so we have a based on my computer screen we have about five to eight minutes left when do you have the same time as me I have 11.44, so we have maybe 15 minutes left. Okay. Oh. Is, there, um, <clears throat> is there anything else? We can wrap it up early or we can close out or we can answer more questions or we can hang around for a little bit mm -hmm. while people formulate stuff because y'all unpacked a lot of stuff. Yeah. And so that, and that's my point, like when we start unpacking all this deep stuff, I want to start kind of bringing us back to not necessarily the sunny side of things, but I want to have a real conversation about sustainability um, because systems are bigger than the individual contributing to that system. And we've had a lot of comments in the chat box about that um, and just how do we keep sustaining and i think this is something we also talked about yesterday um going and taking a hot bath it isn't really gonna really wash away all the racism that i've experienced on a day-to-day -day basis or you know the woman who still follows me in the grocery store to make sure i'm not sticking anything mm -hmm. in my pocket um because that still happens <laughs> like you know um and how do we really and i, I want to start with our panel members but i also want to hear from the audience too how do we keep doing this work? How do we sustain ourselves um, to keep moving forward? So. Yeah, that's real. Uh, um, when, you know, I, I agree and just, I think this webinar alone and seeing the comments and I'm, I'm sorry if we haven't offered as many solutions, but I think having these conversations aims us towards the solutions. And for me, that helps sustain me to hear, you know, what, what people are saying and knowing, yes, like we have all experienced different forms of this in different ways. Our experiences are different, but we're not making this up in our head, which is what I think sometimes people like to make us try to believe in a way to, you know, push us down is that this is not a real experience. And so for me, being surrounded by like-minded you know, people, and by like-minded, I don't mean like the exact same thing I'm thinking, but who recognize how important anti-oppression work is. And when I'm around them, we have these conversations similar like we're doing on this panel that just re, you know, fill my tank and help me feel like I can continue doing this because I have support. Um, so that, I mean, that really helps me, but also just being real and being able to 
just talk about how much it sucks. I mean, like, it's just, I think that helps because we don't always get to talk about that in our day to day lives or um, in our workplaces or anything. And so just having a safe space to be able to talk about our experiences and just have someone listen to them and not say, like, um, I totally understand what you're going through or anything like that, but just to, you know, listen and, and have that, that space is, is helpful, at least for me, and has helped, um, helped me be in this work longer, I guess. Yeah, we talked about this oh, last night, and I shared that I really struggle with the concept of self-care because it's become this, like, commercialized idea of, like, yoga, deep breathing, and cold-pressed juice, and I just don't get it. <laughs> Um, and I think like for me, self-care or more like how do I survive and like come back to work every day is finding like a safe coworker and I have one. And I mean, I love everybody I work with. It's not bad. It's the person that I know I can be a hundred percent real to because she is working alongside me in the work that we're doing at this agency. And I think also finding people in the movement that you are able to resonate with to talk to about work and life in general and being able to combine those two things with healthy boundaries has been helpful um also like on a more personal note traveling like having to leave the work that i do has been great um i had a co-worker tell me it takes three days for your brain to fully turn off and process all of what you've been doing and so learning from her i had the privilege of being at a place that has really good pay time off um, and so I make sure that in increments, I take over three days so my brain can actually turn off and I can relax and then come back and do the work. And as people of color, you're not supposed to relax. And my mom is the brown auntie who legit is like, you're lazy. What are you doing? Well, mm -hmm. and I'm like, dear Lord, this is not going to be fun because she doesn't get PTO is not a concept for South Asian people. You must always be working. Um, and so being able to be like, actually, yeah, mom, like I'm done, I'm doing this work and I'm leaving for a week. So I'm not talking to anybody um, for a week and owning that because I think for folks in direct service, we really struggle to leave and to let go and to cut off from the people that we're serving, and I promise you, they will still be there. Your coworkers will handle it. And if they can't handle it, great. Let's see what you can address when you get back. That way that doesn't happen again. Um, and I say that with fierceness because that's something I've learned in the past three years is you, you have to do it for yourself if you wanna keep um, working in, in this movement. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, and there's a comment from Helen McDonald it says, I think it's important to build networks to sustain the work and especially building networks that may be non-traditional. Mm -hmm. Joining forces with people who are aligned around different access, accesses of anti-oppression work and who use a variety of tactics, mm -hmm. uh, tactics, nuances, the that nuances the work and spreads the wealth of resources so that, for example, people who are doing racial justice work have the tools also to, to work against interpersonal violence. And people doing anti-sexual violence work have the tools to also work for immigrants' rights, et cetera. Mm -hmm. And um, if I can, one of the most valuable things for me in, in just being able to keep doing this work over a long period of time is connecting with my culture. What sustains me culturally to keep me informed and listening to my community and how they want, how they would like to move forward, which is not often uh, talked about. Like if we go do a focus group, we may hear stuff, but when you're living inside your community with your family, your friends in the grocery store, you're hearing something else. Mm -hmm. So to stay connected with that, to know what is really going on in the community and what's important to, to the community and to bring that back into our, our agencies to expand the work that we do. Mm -hmm. That's my two cents for today. I'm gonna be quiet now. <laughs> you're fine, Wendy. I think, yeah, Helen, that makes a lot of sense to to uh, network with other people. And I think um, taking the stance on that where you guys build like 
a ta not maybe not a task force, but some kind of partnership community where you guys all meet together, whether it's casual or formal. Um, I'm definitely preferring the casual that you, so you guys can build trust and relationships. That way you are able to rely on, on each other and learn from each other. I think that's something that we always say that we do and that we never and all of the work that we do, we just don't have quote unquote time for it. But I think it's important. I think it's super helpful. That way you can meet people and that might be your source of self care and support for yourself. Um, because no one will be able to fully understand the work that you do, but the people who are doing it with you, right? Mm -hmm. um, Crystal, is it okay if we really quickly talk through the comment from Jose Juan and Pam really quick? Absolutely, yes, let's do it. Um, Pam was saying about um, how about when your allies are POC, but their their agenda is different. That does not incorporate the whole. Um, I don't want to leave on a, a negative note, but this reminds me a lot of horizontal racism is what I've kind mm -hmm. of talked about and coined it. It's like um, maybe when your identity does not seem as important or as oppressed and we get into playing um, who has it worst case scenario. And that's what that reminds me of. Mm -hmm. And I think well, if we're really gonna do integrated anti-oppression work, we're not comparing, right? Because everybody's experiences are different. And I think having all people at a table is super valuable and, um, we have a lot to learn from each other. And I will say that for, for, for communities of color within, like for example, South Asian people, there are pockets of people that are so different. It's a really, really big part of the world and a big part of the US now. And so I think it's really important that we don't group people and assume only certain POC have valid experiences. Mm -hmm. um, and call them out or in. I, I mean, I would call them in because I don't want to be I don't want to confront my uh, fellow POC or allies and have uh, and have them understand because it could be a lack of understanding. And if it's intentional, let's address it and talk about it. Um, so I'm going to stop there. No, I love that, Sundal. I agree with that. That's a huge thing that um, happens and figuring out how to have that conversation. Like you said, like if they're willing to be called in, um, but going back to the this integrative anti-oppression framework. So trying to have that conversation to get them see, you know, yes, they may have agenda that doesn't incorporate the whole, but how can we figure, you know, come to an agreement on all of this is connected mm -hmm. um, and we have to work together to move move forward. Um, and kind of connecting that with, um, with JJ's uh, comment on getting funding to do that culturally responsive work, but not being willing to share that funding or even connect with the ones that are already doing the work. Um, I hear that and that's something that has been a pet peeve of mine too. And it's just a struggle because especially if you are within the community and um, and then you see, I mean, I, I know I've been in position before at, an, at one of the agencies I worked at where we're saying again that we're going to try to do these culturally specific services and then when the client doesn't meet our definition that we're able to serve we refer them over to that agency doing that culturally specific work but we're not working together to support their work we're not helping support their funding we may be applying for funding streams that say that you know we're doing the work when we're not um and i think that goes back to the bigger system that's in play and how can we bring more people to the table to figure out and, and validate the type of work they're doing. Just because it's not counseling inside a building doesn't mean it's not healing work. And I think that's a hard thing. Um, and I've seen it at conferences where they're talking about, well, you know, people of color don't really come to counseling. It's just not in your cultural, you know, background or, or whatnot. And, and to me, um, I, you know, struggle because I'm like, well, what kind of, you know, one, is counseling the only way we heal is, or is that the kind of, you know, white oppressive norm that we're talking about and are we just perpetuating that same process? And so how can we, how can we push back on that and create more options that are supported also by funding? You know, I think that goes back to the bigger system. How can we get to those at the table who decide where the funding goes to so they recognize the non-traditional um, types of healing? And I know that TOS has been doing some of that work um, as well to, to validate that. And I think that's a great way of being part of 
this change is coalitions recognizing that is huge because a lot of times they're connected to the funding streams too. But also sharing the funding sources, right? I know a lot of people are secretive and it goes back to competing as a nonprofit, which is the exact opposite of what anti-oppression work is. And I think it's as simple as telling people like, hey, that of HOCA funding, that's what this does. Go and apply for it. You don't mm -hmm. gotta share what you wrote, but just be transparent about it because you're obviously not doing that work if you're referring them out. Mm -hmm. I also see a comment about, need to talk about internalized oppression. It could be a whole different <laughs> webinar. <laughs> Um, I think that comment to me, it's about what Pam was saying about like POC who have their own agenda and it aligns to me about internalized misogyny because they go hand in hand together mm -hmm. and there's so many different examples of that currently playing out I'm sure at different agencies and just in general in this country that um, I definitely think there's a, a lot that goes into internalizing your own oppression and what you think you're able to do about it and what you expect other people to do about it. Um, so I'm gonna stop there because I know we're about to hit time. Yeah. I wanna be respectful of everyone's time, but I think y'all just booked yourself another webinar. <laughs> <laughs> That's what we're here for. <laughs> I really like all of the things that we've talked about today, being the token, um, like the ways that nonprofits will, um, exploit that's the best word that's coming to my mind right now but exploit our our clients to pander to certain communities like all of this stuff in and of itself we could do a webinar every single week um just because this this topic is so broad um and and you know that's part of us needing and we need to have these conversations in a, a meaningful way so um that's just me. I'm asking for additional topics. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Do y'all have topics that you'd like to discuss on future webinars? Please share yeah. with us because this is, um, we have spent a long time, probably the last two years, Holly, you can back me up on this or, or um, correct me, rebranding our task force because um, we recognize diversity task force was, isn't going to work for us no more. And the way we were approaching the work wasn't going to work for us. So we were taking a long time to rebuild, um, to update our own selves, because that was always our goal was to to lead the work. And a lot of our ideas got internalized and spread out throughout TASA and throughout the field. And so it took us a little bit of time to move that forward and come back with new content for y'all that's still at the front of the field. Um, so this really, it's our first series in a long time, but definitely not our last series. Um, by any stretch of the means so okay and crystal i just said send the the ideas to you bring it on yes yes bring it on okay if anybody has anything else to share right now now's the time to do it we're right at 11 30 and i want to be respectful of everybody's time <clears throat> and everybody's professional time today thank you crystal thank you sundal thank you Halle. I have, it's been a pleasure to work with y'all. Okay. It's been great working with all of y'all. Thank you for everyone in your comments. I mean, I, I, please join us and, you know, we're always looking for people to also help participate and be part of future panels too. So um, really, yeah. really excited that we had y'all in this conversation. I feel like it was really um, impactful for, for me at least. Same. Thank you. It was great to hear everybody's Hi. thoughts and opinions. Good to know we're not doing this alone. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, all right. So, like Wendy told us before, uh, give us about 10 days and this recording goes on to the TASA YouTube channel. Immediately after this webinar, uh, Wendy is um, sends out the PowerPoint and the slides that we included today. Um, anything else, please reach out to me. Um, you need to get a hold of these two ladies. I didn't want to pass their contact info without consent. So I'll 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 field that and then pass that information on to them. So you know. <laughs> so. Okay. Thank you all. You can all un <clears throat> you can go off your webcams right now.
and that's Yay! fine. And just to reiterate, <laughs> you'll get a follow-up email in about an hour. It will contain the evaluation and links to the webinar and a certificate of attendance. Please fill out the evaluation and send it back. It helps us with our funders. It also helps us with um, to make sure that if ever question, we can say, yes, you attended the webinar. Thank you all so much and um, have a pleasant Friday and a pleasant weekend. Bye-bye.